Hey guys, Dr. Childs here. Today we're going to be talking about six causes or six root causes of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Now, these causes are really important because number one, they are potentially reversible. And number two, if you can identify and treat them, you might be able to positively impact the course of your disease and or potentially halt its progression or potentially reverse your condition. So they're actually very important. Uh, we'll be talking about these six causes, what they mean for you, uh, how to identify them, how to test for them, and so on uh, in this video. If you don't know me, I'm Dr. Childs. I'm an internist and I specialize in helping people with thyroid problems, helping people with hormone imbalances, and of course, helping people lose weight. But today is really about the thyroid. Well, and really it's about Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Now, this idea and concept of finding the root cause of your condition has gained a lot of popularity um, among patients, right? Because it, it sounds really good in theory. If you can identify the main cause of your disease state, well, if you treat that disease state or you treat that problem, then perhaps you can impact your disease state and actually potentially cure your Hashimoto's. And while it sounds really good, and it does actually work sometimes um, in practice if you can do it, it's not necessarily going to solve every person or everyone listening to this. If you're listening to this and you have Hashimoto's and you identify your root cause, it doesn't guarantee that you're going to solve that problem. So I want you to be aware of that right off the bat. And as we kind of talk about these things, um, I'll tell you sort of why um, and how that may be um, or why it may be that it isn't going to solve your problem 100%. But nonetheless, it is still very important because it gives you a lot of additional information and something to treat and identify in your disease state. So let's talk about these. Now, again, these are all potential causes. These are triggers, things that, that if they are present in your life can actually activate and change your genes in such a way that Hashimoto's thyroiditis is expressed, you'll have the antibodies in your body and you will then start destroying your thyroid gland. So number one is stress. And really what I'm talking about here, and this is non-specific intentionally, by the way, but really what I'm talking about here is any sort of stress. So this could be physical stress. This could be something like getting in a car accident, um, or being under a lot of physical stress from perhaps overtraining, uh, doing things like overexercising, uh, running triathlons, I mean, you, you name it, any sort of physical stress. Another thing could be social stress. So let's put this up here. We got physical, um, we got social, and we got emotional. So social would be things related to work, you know, uh, driving in, in your car, getting in a car accident, the actual social stress associated with that, um, or that would also potentially be under emotional. Um, problems with, let's say, spouses, problems with relationships, that sort of thing, that falls under social. And then emotional would be anything that is a, is a problem with you um, internally, okay? So the, how you're reacting to relationships, the inability to put up boundaries, that sort of thing. So all of these things can be associated um, well, they they're associated with stress and stress itself can be a cause of Hashimoto's. In fact, it's probably one of the, in my opinion, number one uh, most important causes and triggers of both Hashimoto's thyroiditis and also flare-ups. So we'll talk about flare-ups a little in a different video here, but just so you get the idea, if you have Hashimoto's, you can be at a baseline. And then if you have something that causes a flare-up, your antibodies will actually go higher and you'll be, un you'll un you'll be in a state where more destruction is happening to your thyroid gland during that flare up itself. So stress, like let's say stress can potentially cause Hashimoto's thyroiditis, let's say, and something that I hear a lot would be divorce. So especially among women, women who have gone through particularly difficult divorces, that can actually, that, can, that by itself can be enough to trigger Hashimoto's. And then let's say, you know, that happens five years ago, you have your Hashimoto's, and then in another five years, let's say someone in your family passes away or something like that. And that can cause your Hashimoto's, which was already started by the divorce, to then become flared up um, as a result of that extra stress on top of it. So stress is really important for that reason. Now, in the beginning, I said that it's not always helpful uh, to know the root cause, and this is probably one of the most important examples of that. So just because you identify that stress is associated with it doesn't guarantee that you can actually fix the problem. So if you go back to my original example of divorce, knowing that divorce caused it isn't enough to, you can't, you can't go back in time and reverse that event, right? Uh, the event happened, the stress happened, and that caused the genetic changes which therefore manifested as Hashimoto's thyroiditis in this hypothetical person. But this does happen to a lot of people. Now, that doesn't mean you can't increase your body's resilience to stress, or you can become more resilient to stress itself through the use of adaptogens and things like that, but it's hard to go back and reverse or fix that problem. So in the, in the case of stress, and it's probably a very common cause of Hashimoto's, it's helpful to know that it's the cause because then you can you know, focus on getting more sleep, focus on meditation and things like that. But just doing those things isn't necessarily going to be enough to reverse the condition, condition entirely. But it is still important to know about. The second one would be Epstein-Barr viral infection, otherwise known as EBV. 
Now, a lot of people are aware of this, and if you're not, I'll just briefly sort of introduce you to the idea. Um, it's very well known that EBV can actually trigger many autoimmune diseases, including Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And in fact, I would say probably up there in terms of number one or number two most important um, causes of Hashimoto's thyroiditis, just based off my own experience. So EBV virus is part of the herpes virus of families, or part of the uh, herpes family of viruses. So there's this huge group of uh, family of viruses that all fall, that are all uh, sort of uh, herpes viruses, and EBV is one of those, okay? Now, the special thing about these viruses is that once they're in your body, they're in your body forever, all right? It's very difficult to completely er er eliminate them or eradicate them from your body. So you originally kind of what happens is you get the first lipid infection, and in the case of EBV, that's something like the flu or like strep throat. So it kind of feels or looks like strep throat, but it isn't. And then over time, um, as you get stressed or as other things happen in your body, it can sort of poke its head out and cause problems as it goes. So in a lot of people, it can either be a result of the initial infection of the EBV virus, which may have happened in high school or something like that, or college, that's when a lot of people tend to get it, or it can happen as you have these flare-ups. So it's something specific about EBV that can change those, those sort of genetics and result in the manifestation of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Now, what's interesting is that a lot of people have sort of a chronic low-grade EBV infection in their body sort of at all times. And there, this, this isn't everyone, by the way, this is just a certain group of people. And I think those are the people who can really benefit from EBV treatments. So you can actually take certain medications or antivirals. You can also take certain over-the-counter supplements um, that treat and kill or help your body eliminate that viral infection, or at least suppress it, you know, cram it down back in there. So it goes back in the cell so it doesn't pop out. Another really easy way to think about this um, is with chicken pox. So if you ever had chicken pox in your life, you know that once you've had chicken pox, you never get it again, which is good. However, chicken pox later in life manifests as shingles, right? So if you ever get any sort of stressful situation, um, shingles can manifest and they can pop out. So it's the exact same thing as EBV. So I want you to think about it in that way. Now, again, EBV is very hard to treat. It's really hard to eliminate completely, but you can get it to a, you know, you can suppress it to such a level that it shouldn't be negatively impacting your body. And it can be something that you should look for. You can look for EBV titers in the blood. You can check if you have antibodies to EBV, if you've ever been introduced to it in the past. Um, part of the issue with checking those vi those antibodies is that something like 80% of the, the population has been introduced to EBV at some point. So you'll probably show up as positive and you have to check additional antibodies like IgG antibodies, IgM antib antibodies to see if you are one of those people that has that sort of subacute level, um, that chronic sort of low-grade infection that needs to be treated. So keep that in mind. Number three um, would be an infection caused by H. pylori. Okay, so we talked about stress being a potential cause, and everyone sort of understands stress. EBV is a viral infection, so infections can cause Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Now, this one, H. pylori, is a bacterial infection. Okay, now the bacteria implicated in causing Hashimoto's in this case is Helicobacter pylori. Now, H. pylori for short, by the way. H. pylori is really important because it's actually, you know, it causes or tends to cause ulcers, stomach ulcers. So it sort of lives in a low um, acid environment in the stomach. And so if you ever, if you're taking acid blockers or anything like that, you're basically creating a ground um, in which H. pylori can thrive and grow. Um, and so what it does though, is it changes the, the intestinal lining in such a way that it causes inflammation and it sort of digs down into the stomach lining and it causes a lot of damage and inflammation in that, in that area, which then results as an ulcer. It also happens to cause a lot of other issues, and that's why it can potentially cause um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Now, H. pylori is kind of also similar to EBV. It's similar but different, right? So if you have H. pylori, you can completely eradicate it with the use of antibiotics. You can take prescription antibiotics, and you can also take some over-the-counter supplements, which sort of help to kill it. Um, but a lot of people who have this, prob this problem will have it recur over time. So even though it's completely eliminated from your stomach, there's you know certain situations like low stomach acid scenarios and so on, which allow uh, it to grow, basically not grow back, but to allow it a place where it can then nestle back into your stomach. So you do sort of get these these periods of um, uh, these these periods where you have the infection and then you can kill it and it goes away, and then you have the infection again and so on. So it can kind of go in this sort of roundabout pattern, but it's not the same way as EBV because EBV is staying around forever. It's just hidden inside of your cells. Uh, but H. pylori is nonetheless still very important. And if you have any sort of gut problems, if you're taking any sort of acid blockers or anything like that, you definitely want to get tested for H. pylori. There are several ways that you can test for that. This is a really easy thing to test for and a really potentially easy thing to treat too, by the way. Um, the, the actual infection itself is some, somewhat difficult to treat uh, because it likes to stick around um, 
so it usually requires you know three prescri- two to three prescription antibiotics with some additional things as well if you're going through your regular uh, doctor. But it can be treated and it's something you should look for and should test for. Now your regular doctor can do the testing for this. You don't need to go anywhere special to get tested for H. pylori. Next on the list would be nutrient deficiencies. Now this is really important. I think these nutrient deficiencies tend to, in my opinion, create a scenario in which um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis can thrive um, and allows it to sort of occur. I don't think they're directly responsible for the triggering of Hashimoto's thyroiditis, but I definitely think they're part of creating the environment which allows it to come through. Now, there are several important nutrients. We could talk about nutrients for a long time, but I'm gonna hit on some of the keys here. So one of those would be vitamin D, which almost everybody that I've tested, by the way, unless they're working out in the sun or taking vitamin D supplements, they're vitamin D deficient. So you should look for that. Another important one would be zinc. Another important one would be selenium. Um, Another one would be glutathione. I'm just gonna abbreviate that there. Um, And then lastly, we'll say iodine as well, because that is actually still very important. So particularly selenium and glutathione play a role in keeping your thyroid uh, protected from free uh, radicals and also from inflammation, okay? So if you start to see that those selenium levels dip or that those glutathione levels dip, and by the way, if selenium goes down, glutathione will go down because your body needs selenium to produce glutathione. In those scenarios, you'll have a lot more inflammation in the thyroid gland, and that sets it up for autoimmunity and and dysfunction and damaging of the thyroid gland cells, which can then potentially interact with your immune system, which can then potentially cause you to develop those antibodies. So these nutrient deficiencies are really important. Now I check every single person for nutrient deficiencies, and I recommend that if you're a patient who has Hashimoto's or thyroid disease or really anything, to be honest, you should always be thinking about nutrient deficiencies. They're very important, very easy to treat, and something that you should never really miss. Vitamin D is something that pretty much everybody with autoimmune disease should be looking at. Almost everybody is deficient, especially nowadays. We just got out of the winter months, so the sun is sort of at a low angle. It doesn't, it's hard to get the right penetration and the right, um, uh, the right amount of rays to reflect off the, or the rays from the sun are reflecting off of the earth. They're not actually penetrating into the skin. So vitamin D is really important. Zinc and selenium are important. Glutathione is important, and then iodine. So iodine really sets up and triggers the problems, but really only in, the situation where you're already zinc deficient and selenium deficient. But I, I wanna include this there, or include iodine here because it is still important. Next on the list would be what I'm referring to as SIBO or CFO. Now you may or may not have heard about these conditions. They're very, very common by the way. SIBO stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and CFO stands for small intestinal fungal overgrowth. So really what we're talking about here is your gut, right? We're really talking about the importance of the gut and that should be as no, come as no surprise to you. Uh, H. pylori played a, played a role with the gut. A stress can play a role with the gut as well. And now SIBO and CFO play um, a role in the gut as well. So what happens in these conditions is that you have a normal amount of bacteria in your gut at any given time, okay? So in certain situations though, such as eating unhealthy foods, stressful situations, Um, taking the wrong type of supplements, killing off those bacteria from things like antibiotics, they can change the environment of the small intestines in such a way that it allows bad bacteria to grow in the place of good bacteria. So it's really, and and honestly, what you can have happen too, by the way, is you can have bacteria that's not unhealthy, but you can just have too much of that. And that condition is called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Now, small intestinal fungal overgrowth is the exact I mean, it's not the exact same thing, but it's not the exact opposite either. It's just an overgrowth of fungal, of, of basically species of fungus, okay? Now, in this case, you probably have referred to it as candida. Um, that's probably one of the most common uh, forms of fungus that can kind of grow in the intestinal tract. It can take over the, the places of the good bacteria as they're killed by, um, if you're using antibiotics or even herbal antibiotics. And this fungal overgrowth, otherwise candida, can cause the same issues as SIBO can, and that is inflammation damage to the gut lining, a change in the, um, the specific type of uh, microbiome species. Some species are very protective against inflammation. Some protect you and speak to your immune system and they help your body to understand the difference between foreign entities and itself and so on. So if you alter these bacterial concentrations in such a way, uh, in, in the wrong type of way, then it can lead to inflammation in the gut, which can then lead to autoimmunity and ultimately Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Now, both of these conditions can be tested for and they can be treated. It's actually not too difficult. I find that many patients, and in, in fact, in the studies I look at, something like 50% of thyroid patients, so if you're already a patient who has, if you're already a thyroid patient listening to this, there's roughly a 50% chance you have some element of bacterial overgrowth in your small intestines. So this is incredibly common. 
Um, I will say from my own experience that treating the bacteria and treating the fungal um, overgrowth syndromes is not super difficult, although it can be in certain situations, but just treating it doesn't guarantee that you're going to fix your Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Although universally, almost every person that I do this in does see some, some improvement. The degree of that improvement sort of depends on various other factors, um, but you're also, you know, in the cases such as C1, C4, you're also gonna be struggling with nutrient deficiencies, which will then have to be replaced and so on. So that's another really important one. You can test for these things. Um, right now, General doctors are probably not very good at checking for SIBO or CIFO, so you're probably gonna to have to see a gastroenterologist to get these sort of tests, um, but there are tests that you can get that should be covered by insurance that you can look at for both of those conditions. Then the last one would be gluten sensitivity, okay? So gluten sensitivity, I'm not talking specifically about celiac disease, um, although that is included in here. I'm talking about basically anybody who cannot tolerate gluten, right? So gluten um, is commonly found in a lot of uh, wheat and bread products, um, it's more complicated than that. So most people know the, the gist of gluten and what it is and, and how it's functioning. But what I want to tell you is that if you are somebody who is sensitive to it and you are putting it into your body, you're consuming it, it can cause a lot of inflammation. Now this inflammation can lead to something called increased intestinal, intestinal permeability, which is another fancy name for, or it's the official name for uh, leaky gut syndrome. Now, really what gluten is doing is it's damaging the intestinal lining. Uh, it's causing um, the the uh, cells that are next to each other, they're supposed to, they're supposed to form these very tight sort of seals to keep uh, the bad things from coming inside of your body and they can actually spread apart. So what happens is as you introduce this, as you get this inflammation, things can get inside your body that shouldn't otherwise be getting in there. So that's really what gluten is doing. Now, a lot of people will, they misunderstand the difference between celiac disease and non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So one is a true um, autoimmune disease to gluten and the other is just more of like a sensitivity or an allergy to gluten. Now, both of these conditions can cause this problem and both should be looked at and both should be assessed. Now, I think you can get tested for it. It's not that hard to get tested for it. I would recommend it if you really want to, but it's so it's just so easy just to remove gluten from your diet for about 90 days, all right? So if you remove it from your diet for about 90 days, see what kind of improvement that you get, if any, and then you can reintroduce it back into your um, diet slowly at that point and see sort of what happens. Are you feeling better? Are you feeling worse? Are you seeing or noticing thyroid gland inflammation at that time? And so on. So it's don't overcomplicate the whole gluten thing. Just take it out of your diet for 90 days to see if you see improvement. And it's, it's honestly really that simple. But if you wanted to, you could get tested for true celiac disease and you can actually also do some indirect testing for non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So both of those things do exist. So by the way, this is not even an exhaustive list of all the things that can cause Hashimoto's, but in my experience, these are probably among the most important, okay? So if you if you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis and if you notice that you identify with any of these things that I've talked about today, leave a comment below. I want to hear about it. So let me know if you think that any of these things have caused your specific case of Hashimoto's and have you done anything about it? Have you tried any of the treatments I've talked about? Have you tested for it? Has your doctor talked to you about it? Let me know, uh, share your experience in the comments below because I want to hear about it. Um, and by the way, if you haven't already, make sure that you download my free thyroid PDF resources. I have tons of information all designed to help thyroid patients. So if you like this sort of thing, I think you'll like uh, those free downloads. So that's all I have for you guys today. And otherwise I will see you in the next one.